All right. Good morning, everyone. We have uh, opened up today's uh, stakeholder meeting um, and letting people in as they join the, the lobby. So we'll be checking on that as we get a couple stragglers coming in. But welcome and thank you again for taking time uh, this month to meet with us and hear updates. Uh, we really appreciate uh, having this, you know, pathway to share information and uh, understand that takes time out of your day to hear that information, but um, we really appreciate the time taken. We will, uh, as always, run through updates and information for you all um, and take questions towards the end. So please feel free to chat those in uh, as you have them throughout the presentation. I will be monitoring um, and we can answer um, anything towards the end of today's hour. So with that, uh, once again, we have Senior Deputy Commissioner Veronica Judy Cecil with us this morning to share the updates um, and talk through all the strategies that Kentucky is employing um, and how we're working with members to, to round out or make our way through the remainder of the unwinding. So I think I can just go ahead and turn it over to you, Veronica. Thank you, Helen. Good morning, everyone. We appreciate you joining today. Um, it, it's great to see. We've got a, a really great, um, I think, uh, participant number today. Uh, we always uh, appreciate people taking time out for the live version of this. Um, although we understand the demands of, uh, on, on everyone's schedule uh, to be able to carve out time. So of course, if you know somebody who couldn't make it, we do record and post um, on our website following the meeting. So I'm going to turn off my video while I go through the presentation, but come, I'll come back on for questions. Oops, sorry. Moving a little fast there. So we always have this slide just to remind everyone we are in the unwinding of the public health emergency that um, officially had to restart our annual renewals, which were on pause during the public health emergency. We had to restart them um, based on a federal law that um, effective March 31st, 2023, states were required to, to um, restart those renewals. Um, the actual public health emergency ended on May 11th, um, as did uh, generally the flexibilities during the public health emergency, but we do have flexibilities in place as we go through unwinding and we'll discuss those. So um, we have a very long list called our Kentucky PHE flexibility tracker on our website. It gives in full detail all of the flexibilities that we're utilizing during the unwinding and the restart of renewals. The ones that you see here on this slide are just the kind of the most recent ones, although they haven't changed since um, I think probably November, uh, October, November, when we were reporting on them. And um, we've just kept them up because they are really uh, some of the more effective ones that we've been able to utilize. Um, the, the largest one that I always like to talk about is the suspend child renewals. Uh, we did get CMS approval to starting with October 2023 renewals to go ahead and su suspend the renewal for a child under the age of 19 and to go ahead and um, give them 12 months of continuous coverage without going through the renewal. By continuous coverage, that means that if there is a report of a change of circumstance, such as uh, income, then we will not process that change. Uh, the child would still remain covered for a 12-month period. And at the end of the 12-month period, there'll be a renewal to determine if the child is still eligible. Uh, and if not, then at that time, the child would be disenrolled. This does, there are some reasons why children may still disenroll from Medicaid, and that includes if they move out of state if um, a, a guardian or parent requests that the child be removed from Medicaid coverage, that happens sometimes when there's employer-sponsored insurance and the family wants to stay together under the same plan. So um, it doesn't mean that there are no child disenrollments during this period of time, but they're very limited. Always try to remember, uh, remind folks that we are, we, just, we did redistribute December renewals. So the month of of December, the renewal number is smaller than, than normal. 
Um, and what we decided to do to try to help with the workload and the um, backlog of pending renewals and applications is try to um, redistribute the casework. So for December renewals, we did we did have some December renewals. If we were able to go out and passively renew, um, also called ex parte, so we go out and we we look at all the information and the trusted data sources available to the state Medicaid agency to see if we can verify the information that we need to redetermine a member as eligible. If we're able to go out and ping those data sources and the information comes back and demonstrates that the member is still eligible, then we're able to passively renew that individual. They don't have to take any action. They don't have to send us anything. We are we automatically renew them and they are granted that um, redetermination and sent a notice of eligibility. We still had cases in December that may terminate. And those cases were primarily around where we kept um, a case in December if it was aligned to another program such as SNAP or TANF. We also had to uh, disenroll uh, in December individuals who might have been extended from previous renewal months because they hadn't responded to a notice. If they've exhausted their extension period, uh, we have no authority to redistribute them, so we had to go ahead and process that procedural termination for lack of response to a notice. So in December, you'll see we'll have um, a, my, what's fortunate, a larger number of individuals that were passively renewed, but we did, did still have some terminations. And I mentioned the extensions. Uh, we did request authority to extend a case a renewal for a long-term care or waiver member if they didn't respond to a notice by, by the renewal due date. Uh, if there's no response, we're, we're allowed to extend that renewal up to three months to conduct additional outreach to that member and to give that member the time that they may need to um, submit that renewal packet so that we can make a redetermination. Th these cases tend to require a little more um, information and are, are more complex. And so we really wanted to provide that additional time for the members. And then for the non-LTC and waiver members, long-term care and waiver members, we are, we are allowed to extend them for one additional month beyond their renewal due date if they haven't responded to the notice same reasons behind that is so that we can conduct additional outreach just to make sure that they um, understand they're going through a renewal and give them additional time to respond. One thing to note um, is that CMS has notified states that they can continue their flexibilities through December 31st, 2024. Um, most of these flexibilities were set to end at the end of the state's unwinding period. And um, now they're saying that states could utilize the flexibilities on through the rest of this year. We are communicating with CMS to understand what that truly means in terms of all the flexibilities we have available. We want to ensure that we're in compliance uh, and we're um, applying those flexibilities as CMS intended. So we'll, we'll keep folks updated on any change to uh, how that gets implemented for the rest of the year. A um, lot of folks are interested in our 1915C home and community-based services uh, waivers and what's happening with them as part of unwinding. As we've mentioned previously, um, when those flexibilities specific to this population were about to end, we were allowed to, and they were scheduled to end on November 11th, we were allowed to amend all six of our waivers and submit them to CMS to request that those flexibilities be extended until a review and approval by CMS of the waiver. So um, so that's how we 
affected the extension of Appendix K waivers. Appendix K is the is the way that we request changes or flexibilities with CMS. So um, we did submit all six of those, and we did receive approval for the Model 2 waiver with an effective date of February 1, but all the other five waivers are still pending, and we'll keep folks updated on that. If you're really interested in um, the HCB 1915C waivers and, and how they are being impacted, there is separate information that we continue to post, and there are separate stakeholder meetings for those. So I do encourage you to go out to our website um, and stay um, updated that way for these specifically. If you have questions about how, especially if you're a provider and you have questions about how flexibilities of, are impacting your delivery of services, you can reach our waiver desk. Uh, you'll see the email address up there in the top right, or you can call the toll-free number and, and we'd be happy to help anyone who doesn't understand um, where the flexibility is and, and what's permitted. So as we expected um, from the beginning of unwinding and the restart of renewals that we would see a, a natural decline in Medicaid enrollment. We did a snapshot at the beginning of the unwinding period and, and our system was able to demonstrate to us that there are folks whose income is above the Medicaid um, eligibility federal poverty level limit and um, or have uh, other reasons why they're no longer eligible. For example, we have members who gain their eligibility because they're in a category, a specific category. For example, um, pregnant women. Uh, pregnant women might have a little higher federal poverty level limit and we give them 12 months coverage, but if during the public health emergency or during the unwinding period, um, they uh, have exhausted that 12 month period, then they are you know, subject to um, us taking a look to see if they're eligible in some other way or uh, be disenrolled. So um, foster children are also another uh, category where because someone is in foster care, they gain el Medicaid eligibility, um, so uh, but they might come out of foster care, and that means that we need to determine them uh, eligible in another category or type of assistance, um, but otherwise we'll be disenrolled. So um, we're seeing the natural trend down, and um, as you see, you know, we leveled out a little bit, but some of that is due to the flexibilities that we've put in a place, that December redistribution. We had, a, you know, a smaller number of individuals terminated um, because we pushed all those active renewals. We only allowed passive renewals. Um, so we've seen a little bit of a... Um, a slight, um, I guess, settling of the number, but uh, we do anticipate it will continue to um, trend down as we complete our unwinding period. So I know this looks pretty busy, and I'm going to go, I'm going to take uh, definitely some time to go through this to help explain it. We are required to file or submit a monthly report to CMS on the eighth month of the month following the month of renewal. So um, for example, for May, when we did our May renewals, we had to file a CMS monthly report uh, by June 8th that explained, that showed CMS what um, the number of individuals that were subject to renewal, how many were approved and in what bucket they were approved. For example, if they were passively renewed, as I explained previously, or they did respond to a notice, um, a renewal form or a request for information, RFI, and we were able to determine them eligible by May 31st, which is the last day of the renewal month. That's always the due date. So, um, so we have to, we, we show them in more detail um, and break down the, the approvals and what bucket they fall in and then uh, how, many, how many folks were terminated. 
all these reports are on our website. And um, so we're, co we're continually still filing those monthly reports. But um, in October, CMS changed their reporting guidelines and asked states to start reporting 90 days past the renewal month to report pending actions that have been processed. So only those that we reported on the CMS monthly report for that month that we reported were pending. They have asked us to go back and with and all the activities or processing that happened in that 90 day period following the renewal month, um, they wanted us to update. We had to do that by December 15th um, for May through, uh, I'm sorry, by December 29th for May through September. And so we, those are on our website. Again, um, any any report we're filing with CMS, we're, we're also putting on our website. But let me just explain this a little bit and I'll use May as an example. So for our original CMS monthly report for May, which was filed by June 8th, we reported 80,673 individuals subject to renewal. Of those, we reported 37,182 were approved and 34,124 were terminated. We also reported that 2,698 were pending. Pending means that we've received a response to a notice or, you know, like the renewal notice or the request for information, and the state was unable to process it before the end of the renewal month. So come May 31st, when we crossed over to June 1st, we had 2,698 cases where something was submitted, but the state hadn't yet taken action. Those individuals remain covered. Any pending member, any, any case that is pending for state review is automatically given extended coverage to the next month until the state can process the documentation. So we started at the end, we reported at the end of May, there were 2,698 pending actions. The 90 days following May, so June, July, and August through August 31st, we processed 2,659 of those cases. So our updated CMS monthly report then uh, properly puts into the buckets for approval and termination those that we processed. So you'll see that after that 90-day period, our approval number went to 38,552 and our termination number went to 35,413. We still had at the time of this report 39 pending May renewals. That can happen sometime if we're working with a case to, um, you know, continually ask for documentation and give that that member the time they need to, and, and us the time we need to work through that processing. A member should remain covered while a case is pending. And we always recommend that if someone is has a family friend, if a patient walks in, if an advocate is helping a member and discovers that they have a pending case, but they've been terminated, then um, they should reach out and let us know so we can, can correct that. We can investigate it and correct it. So as you see for each month thereafter, and I'm not gonna go through every line, um, again, this will be posted and you can go back and look at it if you want. Um, we went through that 90 day processing period for each month and then updated their approvals and terminations and pending buckets. So that is May through September. So moving on, um, we uh, our October updated report is actually due today. Um, and we are finalizing that and getting that submitted. But uh, since we hadn't submitted it yet, we kept October on this page, which tracks each month that um, still has that 90 day period for reinstatement purposes. 
So right now, if someone does get terminated for lack of responding, that procedural termination, they could come and after that termination date, within 90 days, reach out to us and let us know and provide the documentation that we asked for or let us know the verification of the information. And if we're able to determine them eligible, we will automatically, within that 90-day period, we will automatically reinstate them back to their termination date as if there was no uh, gap in coverage. So this is a key um, flexibility that we keep talking about because if, again, friend, family, provider, or advocate, if you're talking to someone who just got terminated because they didn't respond, they could still provide the information within that 90-day period and they would be granted that reinstatement, um, retroactive reinstatement. It's, they shouldn't have to ask for it. It should happen automatically. But, um, you know, we that's why we really tell folks if they're in that 90-day period after their termination to please encourage them to um, respond. So looking at just um, tracking the reinstatement for October, we've had 5,210 um, that have been reinstated. We've already reported on our November and December numbers, so I'm not going to go into them. Um, but uh, again, tracking reinstatements for those folks. Still have a couple of cases pending for those, those two months. Um, and the extended is that bucket of individuals that I mentioned, they might have the 30-day extension, or if they're a long-term care or waiver, they might get up to three months extended. So we keep we keep track of those. So let's take a look at January, because this is information um, that is uh, fairly new. Um, so in January, we did have a large number of um, individuals subject to renewal. 121,236. We were able to approve. We had 22 cases that crossed over that January 31st date that are pending. And then we have a large extended bucket. Um, there are a lot of individuals in January that have the availability of the one month or up to three month extension. So um, those are the January numbers. Um, I will note that we are currently um, verifying, going back and doing some quality checks of our reporting. Um, we have noted a potential error in reporting individuals in a pending bucket when they actually were um, either approved or terminated. It's a very small number of individuals, um, but we you may see that uh, we have updated reports on our website following the review, and um, that should occur. We're completing that, and that should occur in the next week or two. We'll keep folks updated if that is the case. And certainly on the call next month, uh, we'll discuss that uh, and the findings of that if it impacts any of the month um, monthly reports. So out on our website, you will also find a demograph demographic report that we've been publishing since September. Uh, it's a really great way just to for us to track uh, looking at race, ethnicity, age, and gender. Um, if we're noting any specific trends or numbers um, for us to go back and dig into a little bit. It also has in more detail at the county level approvals and terminations um, and lets us evaluate if we're seeing um, a rate of a termination that um, is concerning to us and what more can we do in that county to ensure, especially if, if it's a large number of procedural terminations, what can we do to um, encourage response to our notices? I should always note that 
because someone's procedurally terminated does not mean they're ineligible um, or does not mean that they are not covered. Uh, some of our, we have noted that some of our um, population has access to commercial insurance and based on their income may no longer be eligible for Medicaid. We, um, we certainly track the numbers that we can see that would be eligible for a qualified health plan and a vac advanced premium tax tax credit. You heard, you might often hear it referred to as APTC, but that um, tax credit can make those qualified health plan uh, premiums either low cost or no cost for individuals. Um, but people might also have insurance through their employer sponsored um, plan. We do know that in tracking each month following terminations, um, the managed care organizations and our fee-for-service uh, IT folks uh, track how many individuals have some type of commercial plan on file. We call it third-party liability. So somebody could be um, on Medicaid but have a third-party liability or another insurance plan. But when we look at go back and look at those who were terminated each month, we are trying to track the number of individuals who have coverage. And what we're seeing is on an average basis about 26% uh, of individuals who are terminated have other coverage. Uh, but anyway, so you can see, um, again, uh, you know, just looking at uh, approvals and terminations by each of these um, demographics. Our outreach priorities really haven't changed very much. A um, couple of things that I've already mentioned is just encouraging anyone in that 90-day reinstatement period who's been terminated from Medicaid to um, reach out and respond um, to their notice or just reach out so we can work with them on determining if that maybe they are truly eligible. Um, so response to notices is important. Uh, we're also making sure that folks who have that categoric eligibility I mentioned previously, that um, they're in Medicaid, it's granted to them automatically because of their category. When that category ends, just understanding that we, in order for us to determine them eligible for another type of assistance, we need information. So. Um, it's really critically important for them to respond to any um, communication or notice they receive so that they are providing the information to us prior to their termination to, um, to see if we can keep them covered in another type. And um, lastly, trying to make sure that someone who is ineligible for Medicaid that they are looking um, for other coverage either through their employer or through a qualified health plan so that they have no gap or as little gap as possible in their health care coverage. We um, and the managed care organizations in the state are contacting members multiple times within their unwinding period, within their renewal period, as well as after. As I mentioned, we are trying to reach out to anyone terminated within that 90-day period um, to encourage their response. But even before their renewal date, they are being contacted by the state about three times throughout that renewal period from when we first go out and um, initiate their renewal to all up until their renewal end date if they haven't responded. The managed care organizations are doing the same for their members. Um, so we send them a file uh, about weekly that tells them who still hasn't reached out, who still hasn't responded to a notice so that they can go out and outreach to their members. And so you can see there's a large number of, of members that are 
being outreached um, not only by the state, but by the managed care organizations. They are also trying to encourage folks um, that fall into that no longer eligible for Medicaid due to income, um, but are likely eligible for that tax credit for a qualified health plan and making sure they understand how they can go out and choose that plan on Connect, the, the state-based marketplace. So um, I don't think we have any new um, informational flyers to report, but just always reminding folks, there's a lot of information out there available on our website that you can pull down. You can post it. You can send it to um, members. You can share it in any way possible. Um, we are encouraging that, especially for our providers. If, um, As you're seeing Medicaid members, it's really great if you could have something posted or you're having a conversation about the fact that renewals have, have started. Um, we're just trying to reach our members wherever they are. And um, so we sent out something to pharmacies to make sure they understand if someone comes in and they don't realize their Medicaid's been terminated, but they're trying to access a prescription, what they can do to help that member. Um, so just, just a reminder, there's a lot of different information out there. We are always open to tweaking um, the language on a flyer to create a new flyer. If there's a barrier that needs some help in explaining, we recently did that um, at the end of last year for the ID proofing that related to the fact that if a member goes and tries to create an account on connect, it's called a self-service portal. And they use that self-service portal to communicate with the um, state Medicaid agency or for, for the application or renewal process. It's really, it's a great way for them to, to do their renewal or application um, because it's all contained within that system, makes it easier on the eligibility worker to pull down the information, and everything is on there so you can see what's happening. We heard that some members were struggling to overcome the ID proofing that's currently required to, to create that account, so we have provided some tips on what a member can do that's trying to navigate that process. We always have this information available um, every month, just to remind folks that there are multiple ways that a member can respond to a notice. They can complete and return a form by mail or fax. Uh, that self-service portal I talked about is a great way to be able to upload information. They can do it from their phone. They can take a picture and upload a document that way. Um, they can always call Connect or the DCBS office. Um, the DCBS office is open on Saturdays from 9 to 12. We understand sometimes trying to call during the, the weekday can be a struggle, but um, Connect is, is open until 7 p.m. during the week. And then, as I mentioned, DCBS call no hotline number is open on Saturdays. And then we encourage our members to uh, reach out to folks that are in their community. We have connectors and insurance agents in the local DCB office in every county. So um, if somebody needs face-to-face uh, -face help, they can reach out that way. Um, but we do have connectors all over the state going to different events um, and trying to be available to help a member navigate either the renewal or application process. Just a reminder to providers that you can um, access a member's redetermination date so that you can, if you have a member coming in, you can check to see when their renewal date is and if it's coming up or if it's the month in which you're seeing them. Just you know, um, reminding them that there may be notices that are on that have been sent to them, and um, it's important to respond to that. So for all providers, they can access that redetermination date or renewal date. Those those words are used interchangeably. You can access them in Kentucky HealthNet. It's on the main page, and as point as it shows here on the slide, it's uh, in red. 
And then for our 1915C waiver, home and community-based services waivers, they have um, in our long-term care providers, you have the Kentucky Level of Care system that allow you to pull your patients um, renewals dates to plan on um, helping them uh, gather the documentation that's needed for that redetermination. For our connectors out there, um, we are trying to remain in communication with them as much as possible to share um, trends or changes that are happening or defects that are identified. So just a reminder to you to please try to access those meetings. This is only for connectors and agents, um, and they also have available to them a case escalation uh, process. So we do ask, please utilize that case escalation process. Um, when you come across a case where there's a dire need or you're discovering that there is an issue um, with that case that needs to be like a bug that needs to be resolved, um, we really need to have those reported up to us. So I uh, mentioned qualified health plans and um, we track, we, we really want to continue to promote those as part of the Medicaid renewal and winding process. Um, our open enrollment for qualified health plans did end on January 16th, but that doesn't mean that uh, the Medicaid um, disenrolled individuals still can't uh, apply for a qualified health plan or enroll in a qualified health plan. There is always a continual special enrollment period for anyone with a qualifying life event and losing Medicaid is a qualifying life event, but you are under a certain period of time that you're allowed to report that qualifying life event and then uh, enroll in a QHP. The great news um, is that we have an unwinding special enrollment um, that is happening for for Medicaid members. So anytime uh, starting from March 31st, 2023, and this is actually now December 31st, 2024, sorry, that's not updated. Um, during that period of time, anytime that the member lost Medicaid eligibility, they can go out and enroll in a qualified health plan. So um, that, that, period of time that's limited for a qualifying life event does not apply to a Medicaid member losing eligibility as part of this unwinding renewal process. They only, when they're applying, they check a box that says that they lost it due to the um, renewal um, ineligibility, and that will allow them to enroll in a qualified health plan. They still have to go out and choose the plan. Um, and sometimes uh, members don't understand that there is some uh, steps they have to take, unlike Medicaid. In Medicaid, if you don't choose your managed care organization, then you'll get a signed one. In um, qualified health plans, if you don't go choose your qualified health plan, you're not covered. So um, very important that members understand that there are actions they have to take to affect that coverage. So as part of open enrollment, we were we had a, a really great um, enrollment. 75,412 enrolled for plan year 2024. That is 15, almost 15,000 more than enrolled in 2023. So happy to see that people are accessing coverage through a qualified health plan. We, um, as part of our unwinding, we continuously track the QHP enrollment, hoping that members who are no longer eligible for Medicaid are going out and choosing a qualified health plan if they're not covered by an employer plan or some other program. So as you can see, we've been tracking that. And as our Medicaid, if you recall, our Medicaid um, graph line showed enrollment going down, but our, our QHP the QHP plan enrollment trend is, is going up. So we want to see that that's happening. And then uh, the banner uh, year of enrollment during open enrollment um, is shown by this line. This 
blue shows the 2023. So just to really demonstrate the large number of individuals who accessed plan and, and plan through uh, open enrollment this year. Always put a plug in for our website, lots of information on there, the monthly reports I discussed, this presentation and recording and every stakeholder presentation we've done each month is on there. Um, all those flyers and information bullet, uh, bulletins are on there. Um, so please, if you haven't, go out and check that out. And then um, always asking folks to follow our social media. You don't have to do all three, but if you could choose Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram to like or follow us, that way you're getting the most current information available about what's happening with renewals and the unwinding period, um, because we will push information out. It's the same information across all three platforms, so following at least one. Um, gets you what you need to know. But if we have a scan that's identified or if there's just something else changing for the unwinding period, we would um, push that information out that way. Of course, you know about our stakeholder meetings because you're on here today. Uh, they will continue through the unwinding period, um, third Thursday at 11. And um, just a reminder, there are numerous, numerous reports out there, the CMS monthly report, the demographic report, and for providers, the CLOCKS report and the Kentucky Health Net renewal information. So I will stop sharing and turn my camera on. And we are more than happy to, to take any questions. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you so much, Veronica. Um, it's a lot of information, but I, I really important updates and and just sort of a sense of what's continuing and and what are the opportunities there. Uh, we had a couple of questions come into the chat. Uh, one of them was about the admin connector meeting that's on the third win Wednesdays. Um, I believe that's a series that's been sent out. Um, two connectors, but um, Greta, Baker, we can uh, check on that for you and see if there's a way to, to link you up there. Uh, we'll connect with our KHBE team for that question. And then um, Ashley Shoemaker wanted to kind of know about the numbers for MCO outreach. And just looking at um, the how well care was a little bit lower than the other mm -hmm. NCOs, but they're a very large, you know, provider or payer in uh, Kentucky. So uh, I wonder if you want to speak to a couple of the nuances there and sort of what they're reporting to us. Absolutely. And, and yes, I noticed that too. And we do uh, inquire as to, um, you know, when we see something that maybe is a, is a little unexpected, um, and it is true that uh, so each of the MCOs are very different in their population that they serve um, or who's enrolled with them and um, where they are in the unwinding process. Uh, as I mentioned, if it's child, if they have a large child population, their renewals are automatically extended, so they wouldn't be outreaching to those folks. Um, or if um, their members are doing a good job of getting notices responded to, or they're going out and choosing a qualified health plan um, if they fall into that bucket. So, um, so we, we do see the numbers, we get the report every month and we do see the numbers, you know, trend differently, but you have to kind of look at the whole picture of what's going on, um, you know, to, to determine um, if there's, if there's a concern, um, there. So I, I appreciate you noting that. Another question that came in was about the stakeholder meeting for the 1915C information and where that link can be found. Um, I was trying to do, I don't know if you can tell me like on my other screen, I was trying to pull their uh, website um, for us. Um, but do you know specifically uh, where we can share that? It should be on our unwinding website and um, it, they don't happen regularly. They generally happen when there's something new to report. So if you're, I, I apologize if I um, 
confused anyone to suggest that there's a regular monthly one. They have a stakeholder meeting um, when there is additional information to share or, you know, they, they do want to provide an update. So there's no regular report uh, meeting. So, um, you, you know, really just kind of have to stay uh, updated. I believe that there is a distribution list um, for that. You could uh, email that uh, email box that was on that flexibilities page and just a request to be added to a distribution list um, so that you can receive a notice when there is a stakeholder meeting held. Yes, and I'm including now I found um, from a past session they had in September, there's some there's some resources there, um, but then also here is a one pager. Oopsies, um, on the information, and it's more than one page. Uh, it's just a couple of questions about the updates to that waiver. Yeah, I do. I do know they. Yeah, they were updating some FAQs, um, which will happen regularly, especially to report it when those waivers get approved by CMS. Um, so they'll, you know, be regularly updating those. And I do believe that there might be a, an update um, to the FAQs, even if there's not a uh, stakeholder meeting being held. Mm -hmm. And here's a link to a page that has some uh, of the previous webinars, and it includes um, the recordings from initial sessions that were um, held for the Appendix K as well. Then on the um, website, you'll also see that there's an email for specific questions about waiver. Um, and that is the last thing I am going to put in the chat for you all. I know I think I'm, you know, putting in hyperlink soup over here. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Helen. All right. So are there any other um, questions that have come to mind as we've been sitting through the, the call today? I think we've answered the ones that are in the chat so far. All right, so not seeing any come through. Um, again, want to thank you for taking the time to, to be here with us today. We will be uploading these slides and the um, recording of today's webinar uh, to the website in the in the coming days or next week um, and and there all the reports are available there so I encourage you to check that out as well please feel free to to let us know if you have additional questions or reach out we're happy to as Veronica noted update any communications materials uh, investigate you know cases that they're escalated through that incident reporting piece um, or case escalation pathway um, but please feel free to reach out and then we will of course host another one of these sessions next month. Thanks everyone. Have a good day. Have a great day.